Welcome to this module in which we will explore personal protective equipment for EMS providers. Once completed with this module, you should be able to describe the equipment available in a variety of adverse situations for self-protection, including body substance isolation steps for protection from airborne and bloodborne pathogens. When trying to reduce the likelihood of workplace injuries or deaths, industrial hygienists utilize practices known as controls to eliminate, reduce, or mitigate recognized risks. The first and most effective type of control is an administrative control. Administratively, an employer essentially mitigates hazards to prevent employee exposure to the hazard. A good example in EMS is requiring the ambulance to stage during an active assailant call until the police have secured the scene and rendered it safe for entry by EMS personnel. The next type of control is an engineering control, whereby the employee must be exposed to a risk, but that risk can be mitigated by the use of technology or smart and intentional design of the environment or process. The advent of self-loading ambulance cots is an example of an engineering control designed to reduce EMS provider exposure to potential back injuries during the patient loading and offloading process into and out of the ambulance. If engineering controls are not adequate to protect against a particular workplace hazard, work practice controls are next in line. A simple work practice control for a paramedic is to never reuse or resheath the needle. Once used or exposed, the needle should be promptly discarded in a sharps container. Lastly, if all else fails, employees should use personal protective equipment, PPE, to avoid exposure to hazards. This includes EMS providers wearing reflective vests or other clothing when functioning at the scene of an accident, the use of exam gloves when assessing patients, and eye protection when circumstances warrant. This hierarchy of controls is important to understand because this particular module talks about PPE, which is the EMS provider's last line of defense against certain types of risks and hazards. Other controls are not available or feasible, or maybe they failed and now all the EMS provider has left is PPE. Therefore, the understanding of PPE, various benefits and limitations associated with different types of PPE, when it should be used, how it should be used, and other factors are of paramount importance to EMS providers looking to maintain their own safety, health, and wellness. Keep in mind as well that these various types of controls can all be used together as well. Starting an IV, for example, commonly involves all levels of controls. Some providers, such as EMTs, are administratively prevented from starting IVs as the skill is outside their scope of practice. Many needles are engineered with safety devices to render them safe once used, which is an engineering control, yet paramedics still discard of them in sharps containers, which is a work practice control, and those same paramedics routinely wear PPE, such as exam gloves, and maybe even eye protection when starting the IV. You never know what type of precaution may save you from a significant exposure or some other workplace injury. Therefore, effectively utilizing all controls available can go a long way in helping to keep a workplace safe for the EMS provider. When deciding what type of PPE is appropriate for use in the patient care setting, the CDC recommends looking at several variables. The first is the type of exposure anticipated. Touching a patient or having a patient touch you is a very different type of exposure than one in which bodily fluids are being splashed or sprayed, which will therefore have an impact on the particular type of PPE being used. If the EMS provider happens to know that a particular patient requires particular isolation precautions, which could happen when picking up a patient from a managed care facility or during an interfacility transport, that will obviously drive the decision as to what types of PPE are appropriate. When looking at the type of exposure anticipated and choosing PPE, the provider must also consider the durability of the PPE itself and its appropriateness for the task. EMS providers cannot exist in a protective bubble. They must be able to interact with the environment and their patients. A level A hazmat suit does a good job of isolating the environment from the provider, but wearing one does not make a lot of sense in all but the most extreme circumstances where its use is a necessity. Lastly, while it should not drive the decision as to what type of PPE to wear, the PPE that is worn should fit the provider correctly. If a N95 mask is to be used, for example, this means the EMS provider has been fit tested to wear the mask prior to actually wearing it, 
in compliance with OSHA's respiratory standard to know the proper size, as a mask that is too big or too small is often ineffective in protecting the wearer. Examination gloves are a relatively simple type of PPE and provide limited protection for EMS providers in that they only protect the hands from infectious agents. Within the realm of EMS, disposable, non-sterile gloves are commonplace. Such gloves can be made of different materials such as vinyl, latex, or nitrile to name a few. Because some patients and even providers can have allergies to latex and latex products, latex-free gloves are becoming increasingly popular. One of the problems with gloves in an EMS environment is that of touch contamination. Once a glove is contaminated, the EMS provider must be aware of that contamination and the need to avoid spreading that contamination inadvertently. Once gloves are contaminated, the provider should not touch his or her face or adjust other PPE with those contaminated gloves. Touching other surfaces such as those in the ambulance, railings, seat belts on the cot, a stethoscope, a computer or a port book, a pen or pencil, cabinet doors, or whatever can all result in touch contamination. If those surfaces are not disinfected afterward, the very contaminant you are protecting yourself against when wearing gloves could very well be on those surfaces once the patient has been transferred and you are no longer wearing gloves. Along those lines, EMS providers should switch gloves when moving between patients if on a scene with or providing care to multiple patients. Failure to do so can result in cross-contamination between patients, whereby a pathogen on patient A is transferred to patient B by the paramedic who neglected to change gloves in between assessing or providing care to the two patients. Eye protection, such as that provided by goggles or safety glasses, obviously protects the eyes from injuries. There are different types of eye protection available depending on the needs of the provider at the time. Some eye protection is designed to protect against fluids entering the eyes. Goggles that seal around the face are generally more adept at serving this function. Impact resistance may not necessarily be a feature of certain goggles, however, unless they are rated as such. Inversely, wearing a pair of safety glasses may protect against flying debris at the scene of an extrication, but they may not adequately protect against splashes or sprays of potentially infectious material if they do not seal against the face. Face shields protect the face, mouth, nose, and eyes, while gowns and aprons protect the skin and clothing. Gowns and aprons are similar, with gowns providing more protection than aprons. Within the EMS environment, it is not uncommon for gowns and aprons to be disposable, as opposed to using gowns and aprons that must be laundered. If fluids are a concern, gowns and aprons should be fluid resistant. Face shields are included with gowns on this slide because they are designed to protect against splashes and sprays, just as gowns are. Face shields should cover the eyes, nose, and mouth to prevent fluid penetration. Some face shields are more effective than others given the way in which they fit, how they are worn, the provider's proximity to the patient, and the nature of the fluid spray or splash. A loosely fitting face shield that does not seal against the forehead does not provide much protection from fluids that are projected up and over the front of the face shield. Masks in respirators protect the mouth and nose. Masks protect against simple splashes, while respirators go a step further by protecting the respiratory tract from airborne infectious agents. To effectively do their job, however, respirators such as N95, N99, or N100 particulate respirators must be sized appropriately for the healthcare worker, which means the employee must be fit tested prior to wearing the respirator. Additionally, if a respirator is worn, the EMS agency must ensure it follows the OSHA Respiratory Protection Standard, which requires medical evaluations of personnel, fit testing, and training before a provider can use the respirator. Properly donning and doffing, putting on and taking off PPE, is important to prevent exposure both during and after contact with a potentially infectious patient. The CDC publishes resources on how to properly don and doff PPE, and you, as a paramedic student, should also be provided with an opportunity to properly don and doff PPE within an instructional lab environment. As such, this presentation will not go into detail as to how a paramedic properly dons or doffs PPE. Just be aware that proper donning and doffing of PPE is critical to minimize exposure to bloodborne pathogens where PPE was used. 
Given your completion of this module, you should now be able to describe the equipment available in a variety of adverse situations for EMS provider self-protection, including body substance isolation steps for protection from airborne and bloodborne pathogens. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, Waukesha County Technical College. For information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.